We are going to see the different strain parameters today and these will be useful in our subsequent lectures also, the basic definitions of strain parameters. So consider that there is a line of length L initial and due to deformation the length increases to L final. So in this case we define elongation E is equal to the length final minus length initial divided by the length initial. What is LF minus LI? This is this much this. We can also call it delta L. So we can write here this as delta L by L initial. Since elongation is defined in this way, length unit divided by length unit. So this will be unitless. Now as per the requirement sometimes we define a term called stretch small s indicated by the length final divided by the length initial and from this equation and this equation we can write s is equal to e plus 1. Since E has no unit, so S equal to E plus 1 also has no unit. Now we will define a third parameter known as the, so I can write 1, 2 and 3 quadratic elongation lambda is given by square of S. That means E plus 1 whole square or also I can write L final by L initial whole square is equal to E plus 1 whole square. Now they are not done just randomly, there is specific purpose in strain analysis to have such a parameter lambda. We will define now the fourth parameter known as the reciprocal quadratic elongation. lambda dash and note that there is a word of reciprocal that means it is a reciprocal of the quadratic elongation is given by lambda to the power minus 1 is equal to e plus 1 to the power minus 2. I said this is unitless so that is unitless so also here lambda is also unitless and so also the lambda dash. Now I will define the fifth important parameter that is known as fundamental strain or logarithmic strain or natural strain epsilon is equal to log to the base e and here is S, S is the stretch. So what I can write from here is that epsilon is equal to log E and here 1 plus E. Now here students have to be very careful. E has come two times but these E's are different. This E is the exponential series. What is that? Just to recollect 1 plus 1 by factorial 1 plus 1 by factorial 2 and it goes up to infinity which lies between 2 to 3. And what is this E? This E is the elongation here. So they are completely different. To make a difference between them, I can write this E as bold E. So you see I have made it bold. So this bold E is different from the unbold E. Now we can also write epsilon log e and I can write as 
lambda to the power 0.5. Why I am saying so? I am speaking this from this relationship. So this I can also write as like this here ln e. From here I can also write epsilon is equal to minus 0 0.5 ln lambda dash. What is lambda dash? It is reciprocal quadratic elongation. Since there is a reciprocal relationship between lambda dash and lambda, therefore, if I introduce here lambda dash, there will be a minus sign here. Because this minus sign can go inside as to the power minus 1 and can take care. So, this also has got no unit. There are many other strain units available in civil engineering, but in geology, overall we are using these five units. And I repeat, none of them have got any unit, but this does not mean all the strain parameters have no unit. That, that is not the case. We will see that soon. Now, what if the E elongation is very small? There can be some approximations be made. Imagine E is equal to 0 0.002. So, it is a small number with regard to some research problem that we are handling. Say, with respect to that, this number is very small and indeed it looks very small. So, in that case I can write lambda from here I am writing is equal to e plus 1 whole square that means e square plus 2e plus 1. Now, since e is very small e square can be neglected. So, from here I can write lambda is nearly equal to 2e plus 1. So, a question comes in exam. Under what situation lambda is nearly equal to 2e plus 1? The answer is when e is a very small number, it is a fraction. Only then it is so. So, similarly we can write lambda dash multiplied by 2e plus 1 is equal to 1 for very small e value. Now, few other things. If I ask you, can stretch be a negative number, what would be your answer? Or if I ask you, can lambda dash lambda be negative? I keep this question for you, I come to this question. Note that since lambda is a square of a number and lambda dash is also a square of a number, therefore they cannot be negative. Since they are square of a number and what kind of number? These kinds of numbers. We are not dealing with imaginary numbers or complex numbers. Since it is a square of a real number, therefore, lambda dash lambda cannot be equal to 0. So, this answer I have given and I am keeping this question for you. A few more things to think about or to discuss. If elongation E is expressed in this way, we also write sometimes percentage or percent elongation which is given by E multiplied by 100 and expressed as a percent. So, now I can write a small problem easy to solve, but you must do it. Unless you do then even this can create trouble in the exam. What is the problem? Imagine L initial equal to 5.1 centimeter, L final is equal to 5.22 centimeter, then find out elongation, percentage elongation, stretch, quadratic elongation, reciprocal quadratic elongation and natural strain or fundamental strain or logarithmic strain. While you do this exercise, be very careful, you have to take 
to the base e and not to the base 10. If you take to the base 10, then this will, that will not be the epsilon value. We were talking about elongation of a line, but what about if the line is compressed? Let us have a look. Say L i is the initial length and after deformation, the length is reduced to L f dash. Previously, we have seen L i less than L f. That means due to extensional stress or extensional force, the line got elongated. Now, here in this case, due to compression, L i is reduced to L dash f. So, this is a case what I am saying is L dash f is less than L i. So, in this case naturally we do not use the word elongation, we use the word shortening and it is given by the change in length divided by the initial length. How much is the change in, in length in this case? this is the change in length. So, it is length divided by length again it has got no unit. This shortening I should write as S h and not as S. Why not as S? Because S is already used as a stretch. So, once shortening is done we can also write as percent shortening and it is given by 100 multiplied by S h expressed as a percentage. This has no unit that also will be just some number and percent. Now, we can write shortening as a kind of negative elongation. Shortening is a negative elongation. So, there is another way of writing shortening as a negative number I can write whatever comes out by this calculation, but I write here let us say minus 0 0.2 this minus can mean shortening, but there is another way of writing I write shortening S h equal to 0 0.2. Now, that automatically indicates this situation and not that situation. Now, let us see a geological example how these trend parameters can be calculated. We will take the case of Boudin's. What are boudins? These are classed due to extensional stress are broken into pieces. There can be various geometries lenticular, rectangular, barrel shaped, fish mouth etcetera. We will take the simplest case. Imagine here is a classed within a matrix and due to extension it breaks into pieces. For the sake of simplicity I assume that they can be rectangular pieces in nature sometimes almost rectangular pieces can also be found. So, so, this looks like this right now. So, this is our initial condition and this is the final condition. We do not see this in nature, we get this in the nature. Now, noting this how to find out how much extension has happened, whether we can find out the strain parameters out of it. The way of solving is that find out this total length and call it as the L final and add up these distances A, B, C, D and E, F and that gives you the length initial before they got broken into pieces they were all together. So, the total length before deformation in this direction will be sum of these lengths and after deformation this is the L final. So, once we have understood the length initial and the length final these equations can give you one by one elongation stretch quadratic elongation reciprocal quadratic elongation the natural strain percentage elongation everything can be worked out. Now, this will be an approximate process basically because when boudinage is taking place some broken pieces will be there. This will strictly speaking A B plus C D plus E F will not be the length initial. Some breakage will happen and the surface may be little bit broken, non perfect nature of the rectangle can be seen. So, we understand we have done an approximate business here. 
However, when we do this exercise, a caution is required. The boudin can be produced in the nature and the natural agents of erosion can create vertical section or horizontal section what we study. Now not in all vertical section and not in all horizontal sections these measurements can be done. There are specific sections required where such measurements can be done. Not just the boudin but we should also look at what is happening outside the boudin. We, we should have an idea of it. Imagine these are the two clasps that got broken apart. Now this is a new space created and nature will not permit the new space. It is all rock slowly deforming, they got separated and a new space is created. So if there is any foliation outside the boudin to be produced that gets sucked inside like this. And this fold actually dies. So this is the common appearance. This will happen only when there is foliation within the matrix. If it is not there, then such clear cut lines cannot be seen. And these are planes in three dimension. So these folds are known as neck folds or necking or scar folds or passive folds. Now note here that passive fold can have a different meaning in structural geology, buckle folding, buckling, bending and passive folding that is another set of terminology. Here passive fold is expressed in a different meaning what is that? Folding is not the main thing happening here, the main thing is extension because of extension passively folding has developed. So that is why this word passive folding has come. Now, once you see such a boudin and the neck fold in the field, you will be, it is possible to decipher in the field the, the fold axis of this scar folded region. Find out this passive fold or scar fold can be tiny, but nevertheless going close and putting your finger here you can make out the three dimensional appearance of this plane and you can understand okay say this is the fold axis I decipher. So now in which section I should study the boudin for the measurements of length initial and length final the answer is in a section which is perpendicular to this fold axis. So this is the fold axis and my section of observation is like this. So this is the wrong section of observation. On this section I will also get the boudins, but there I will not measure the length initial and length final. Perpendicular to this fold axis is my hand here which is parallel to this board. So this board is also let us say perpendicular to the fold axis. In that case only I will take these measurements as let us say Li1 and Li2 and then Li1 plus Li2 is equal to the length initial Li. So for more than two boudins also same process will work. Why we are doing the idea is once you decipher the fold axis perpendicular to the fold axis is the geographic direction of extension that has happened in the past giving rise to such boudins. So if I have a clinometer or a Brunton I can tell you what is the orientation of this chalk? What is the trend of this chalk? This geographic direction, the trend is worked out. Then 90 degree plus this and 90 degree minus that trend is the trend of extension. So that also can be worked out. In this way we should look at the proper section for deciphering these parameters from the boudin. It is not a difficult exercise. Boudins are available in many of the Indian terrains. A place where we take students is the Ambaji Basin. This is in the Gujarat Rajasthan border near Mount Abu. There is a place called Surpagla. The international community does not know that this place has got tremendous variation of boudins, folds, faults, dikes, etc. There we usually conduct this exercise and students come out that 
along with geographic direction of extension, what are the parameters of strain? Now, just like Boudin, we can also take the Belemnites, which is a cigar shaped fossil, and that might be extended and broken, boudinized in small scale. Same process works. Imagine these are the pieces of a Belemnites fossil, and then we can work out the length initial, the length final. So, we have seen that an initial length L0 extends to LF, where the line indeed changes its length and we can find out the elongation parameter, then percentage elongation and so many other things one by one. Then we have seen the boudin where the material actually breaks into pieces and what happens is that the line length actually in reality does not increase in a manner I have shown in the first case. Now I am going to see the third case. Imagine it is a normal fault. So, the AB marker line has been displaced to B dash C. B and B dash were points which were together. Either we can think that this block has moved up or we can think that block has gone down or there is a relative movement which is shown by these two half arrows. Now, in this case, how much is the extension if we want to find out? So, basically, we can extend the AB line up to point M and then we can drop a normal on the B dash C line. So, this AM length will be considered as the length final and what is the initial length? AB length plus B dash C length. Once L0, the initial length and the final length are known, we can find out the strain parameters. Now, suppose the situation is complicated such as the Hortz and Graben geometry where we can see this is a normal fault dipping towards the right hand side and there is another normal fault dipping towards the opposite direction. The in between portion has gone down like a Graben and this portion have moved up like a Horst. So, then also following this principle one can find out the strain parameters from here which I am leaving up to the viewer to get done. Now, I am going to show you the case of a reverse fault where the AB marker line got slipped to B dash C at the other side of the faulted block. The half arrows indicate the relative movement. Now, how to find out the strain parameters from here? From C, I have to drop a normal on a line that I extend A, B and further and that intersection between A, B extension and the normal from C on the A, B extension is the point K. So, now what we can say is that the L final distance is A, K. This much is the L final and how much is the L initial? The L initial will be A, B distance plus the B dash C distance. So, here also since we know the, fine, the initial length and the final length, the strain parameters can be calculated. Now, let us look at a situation when the Boudinets class are not completely separated. They almost got separated, but still they are connected. What we call in nature, in the natural examples as the pinch and swell structures. How will that look like? Imagine there is a quartz vein and that now looks like this. This is not the natural appearance of the quartz vein before deformation. Before deformation, the quartz vein or dike essentially or some clust will be like this. So, what has happened during a tectonic extension, they got pinched here and swelled there. So, pinch and swell structure that is what we say. They are we can call as incompletely developed boudins. So, here finding strain parameters, these parameters elongation stretch etcetera will be a little bit tricky. We see clearly this case and that case what we did are different. Here the class were completely separated, here the class are still connected. This is a pinched part and this is a swelled part. So, we start with an ideal geometry of pinch and swell and then that concept can also be applied on the real pinch and swell structures. Consider such a geometry of a pinch and swell structure. I know it is highly idealized, but things can be well explained and then you can apply on the natural structures as well. So, what has happened? This is a pinched portion, this is a swelled portion. The question is how much is the elongation, how much is the stretch, etcetera. You note if we find elongation, rest can be all 
calculated because all of them are somehow linked with the E term. Okay. Now what we do is that away from the pinch and maybe away from the swell also you find a place where the layer is having almost the same thickness. And here we decide, say here we decide an imaginary line and here also I decide another imaginary line and we call these as the pin lines, they are looking, looking like pins. Where the layers are undeformed, there I have placed two pin lines. Now, these imaginary pin lines, if we think before deformation where they were in the mental model, these pin lines might be close to each other and because of extension the pin lines have gone far away from each other. Now within this rectangle with imaginary pin lines, mental model and before deformation, one can find out the area ABCD. And in this case, this length for sure can be obtained from the photograph. Say this length is L final and this AB equal to DC length equal to length initial. Length initial is unknown, length final is visible to us. Now assume that this AD pin has come over there, BC pin has come over there. So this is now A dash, D dash this is B dash and that point is C dash. Now we assume that it is a constant area deformation, area has not changed. That means the AB multiplied by AD length should be equal to this much of area. Let me write down. Say we are dealing with constant area deformation. So the area under consideration before deformation is given by AD length multiplied by the AB length. And note that far away from this pin line, the AD length has to be maintained. So this length we can measure from the photograph and say that that itself is the AD length. So the area before deformation is this AD length which is available from the natural photograph multiplied by the length initial. Okay. Now area after deformation this has to be found out can be found out by various means. For example, I can break this area into a rectangular area. I can do length multiplied by width and I get the area. Then here is a trapezoid, there is a trapezoid. They may be of same geometry or slightly different geometry. These trapezoids areas can also be calculated. How to find out the trapezoids area? Say this is a trapezoid. I can drop two normals here. I will calculate the area of this triangle, of that triangle and of this rectangle. We can do that here and by doing that I can find out the total area of this trapezoid, that trapezoid and the rectangle. Once we do that, the area after deformation say it comes out to be A dash, A dash is the area. Once I was calculating the area in this way, some of you might be thinking the area calculation in another way. Let me demonstrate that. This is the irregular rather irregular geometry from where we have to find out the area that is what I said and I broke it into one rectangle and two trapezoids. You can also break in another way. For example, you can join them and this might be easier actually. You get a rectangle and you find out this rectangle's area and you have got four right angle triangles you can find out their areas. So by various ways you can find out 
the area of this place. These two areas have to be the same. So therefore, I can write the AD length multiplied by L initial is equal to A dash. From here, we say that the length initial, the distance between the pin lines imaginary and before deformation is equal to A dash divided by the AD length. So we basically find out what was the distance between the two pin lines before deformation. So and from the diagram we can clearly see that L i is less than the L final that has to be because there is an extension. So now this matches with this case and I can apply the formula and find out the elongation. Once elongation is obtained immediately we can find out the stretch percentage elongation, quadratic elongation, reciprocal quadratic elongation and natural strain or fundamental strain or the logarithmic strain. So here the big assumption that has worked is the constant area deformation. How do I know that in the nature there is a constant area deformation? Well, constant area deformation can be a manifestation of a constant volume deformation. How do I know in nature there is a constant volume deformation? If there is no partial melting here and if there is no injection of melt within this boudin, then I can think that this is of a constant area deformation. Now you may find smaller pieces of boudins here and there, then that will be creating more trouble. From where these small pieces have come, from the main body itself. Then if possible also incorporate these areas into the calculation. Now come to the real world situation. In the real world situation, the pinch and swell structure looks like this. Far away from this pinch and swell structure, far away you get this is a undeformed say quartz vein. So from here you find out the AD distance okay. and from here, here I can set the pin lines find out this area. Now another question comes how to find out this area. So I just now discussed about the pinch and swell structure and I showed an ideal geometry. Let me redraw that geometry. What I was talking in terms of a small scale, maybe few centimeter, few meter or even things under a microscope. So this can be less than one millimeter. The same principle can work if it is we are dealing with kilometer scale such as a rift basin. extensional basins etc. Imagine a cross section of an idealized basin I am watching. So that means it is no more few meters this can be say 80 kilometer length. We can nevertheless find out the how much is the extension etc has happened. So what do we do? We can set the pin lines here. So anyway let us take these two and I am starting. So in the process of the pinch and swell structure and the E calculation same thing will be done here and we will come out with elongation and we can find out S the stretch. Now this S in some book has been called as the stretching factor of the basin. Now I fully understand such a geometry of the basin is ideal but we start with always the ideal case and we always look at how the realistic things can be explained. We always start with the idealistic things. Instead of this geometry if you are constructing the basin of this geometry or the pull apart the parallel pull apart structure or the pinch and swell like this then also same process will work. There is absolutely no problem. Think of pin lines proceed in the similar manner and reach the elongation. Once we are looking at elongation, reciprocal quadratic elongation etc. they are of all unitless but not all the strain parameters are unitless. For example, when we consider the rotation the unit comes into picture. Imagine there is a line AB before deformation. So I can call it the orientation initial okay. and after deformation it has rotated to a dash b dash maybe maintaining the same length or by increasing the length. Whatever be the case I can always find out 
from the initial position to final position in a clockwise direction how much is the angle of rotation and that angle theta is a measure of the angular shear strain. Sometimes we instead of theta use tan theta that I can call as the tangential shear strain. Now this theta naturally has a unit either in degree or in radian. Or radian. So in this case, a strain unit, a strain parameter has a unit, and that is degree. It is not unitless in this case. Tan theta is, by the way, unitless. Note that if I take clockwise rotation as positive theta, the anti-clockwise rotation has to be taken as a negative theta. So from A B, suppose this is the orientation of the line. A double dash B double dash and it has rotated in a counterclockwise direction then I have to write this as minus phi negative symbol will come. Now in some book clockwise rotation is positive and anti-clockwise rotation is negative. In some other book clockwise rotation is negative and anti-clockwise rotation is positive. The idea is that they should be of different sign if there are two directions of rotations involved in the same problem.